Thanks for joining us today. I'm Mama Valerie again, the Youth Director here at LifePoint. Welcome to our worship service this morning. Thank you for joining us. I again want to let everybody know that we have a youth service on 9.30 on our church Facebook page as well as our church YouTube page so you can check that out. And we also have a children's service as well that airs at 9 o'clock on our church Facebook page and on our church YouTube page. So check those out if you haven't already. Um, have a wonderful Sunday. Enjoy our service this morning. Worship along with us and we'll see you soon. Bye.
never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop cause you are
Good morning again, and I want to add my welcome this morning as we gather together to celebrate our King. I want to thank our, our worship team again, those of, of you who've come together to help lead us in worship and song, and I pray that you have not only enjoyed it, but that you have joined in and have sung with us as we sing our praises to God. In a few moments, we are going to be um, going into the morning message, and we are continuing on a message of hope. Hope, it's just something that permeates the whole Bible from the beginning into the, to the end. I talked about that last week. I'm going to talk about it more this week and more next week. Hope is something we all need, but I want you to know it's out there and it's out there for you. So I look forward to uh, bringing God's word to you in a few moments. I also want to thank all of you who continue to faithfully give of your tithes and offerings. I pray you're being blessed. I pray your homes are going well. I pray during this tough time that uh, God is taking care of you because he wants to. Uh, there are a couple of ways to give. You can write a check to Celebration Center Church and mail it to the um, address that you see on the screen if you're part of our Woodland campus. If you're part of the Real Linda Life Point campus, uh, write a check to Life Point and mail it to, the, the, again, the address you see on the screen. Or you can text to give, and there's a number on there for texting to give. Use your cell phone, text to give. It's really simple. Let me pray for our offerings at this time. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the faithful who have continued to give and support your mission. Thank you, Lord, for everybody who's out there. No matter what they're going through, I pray you'll continue to carry them and lift them and encourage them. Bless the tithes and offerings and help us to use them to the furtherance of your kingdom. And help us to always remember it's your kingdom and your money, not ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, I want to thank everybody for joining us this morning on our Facebook Live audience and our YouTube audience. And whether you're watching this on Sunday or you're watching this any other day of the week, maybe it's a time of, of despair and you just need to hear a word from God. I pray that you hear him right now, this, wherever you're sitting right now at this very moment. I want to ask you something. Do you know that living with Christ is to live with hope? Living with Christ is to live with hope. What I mean by that is, really what I'm saying here is I hope that everybody that hears these words today, they're from God, they're not from me, I'm just a voice piece, that as you hear the words today that you'll be ready to claim, no matter where you are, you'll be ready to claim the living hope that's made possible only through the Lord Jesus Christ. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, we are in the middle of a multi-part, uh, very short sermon series on something huge in the Bible, hope. Hope. Who does not need hope during these times of trials and struggles? And frankly, yeah, we've been through it recently, but hope is something that's been needed because of struggles from the beginning of time, from the days of Adam and Eve. And one of the things I'm going to show you over the next few weeks is that the Word of God demonstrates to us over and over and over again as you thumb through these pages from one decade to another, in fact, from one moment to another, from one day to another, from one week to another, it shows us that God comes through. He's always there with hope for us, and He's there with hope for you right this very moment. Last week we talked about the progression of the Bible, and we started off with the very beginning of time. Time as man knows it. Time means nothing to God. But the very beginning of time, when God placed Adam and Eve on the earth, he placed us in this utopian era that everybody, even those that don't yet know God, has heard of called the Garden of Eden. It was a wonderful place where every need was taken care of. And you'd think we could have just lived eternally in this, in this prosperity. But if you looked at history, you might think that hope was lost in an instant when sin was introduced to the world when Adam and Eve defied God and did something, and they ate of the fruit of the garden in an area from a tree they were told not to. You think all was taken away because they were banished from this wonderful place, but God had a plan for hope. Even then, even before it happened, he had a plan for hope to redeem them and take care of them. And he has a plan for you today, no matter where you are. We progressed through that. We looked at Abraham. Abraham was one of the great fathers of the, of the church of the early days. And Abraham went through a time of struggles where God sent him off into another land, but he gave him great hope. And he told him that his, his lineage was going to be multiplied greatly. 
We looked at Moses. Moses was brought along when the Israelites were captive for hundreds of years in Egypt as slaves. God used Moses to give those folks hope to take them out of slavery to a land of milk and honey. And today we're going to progress even further and look at other saints and prophets in the Bible, show examples of where God comes in. He's always there ready to provide hope. So I want you to think for a moment about your attitude in life. What is your attitude in life? Are you living for the moment saying, oh my goodness, what's going on in my world? I can't take it anymore. It's easy to live that way. I do it myself sometimes. Or are you really on this road with Jesus? Maybe you don't know Jesus yet, but I hope before today's message is over, you'll get to know him personally. And if you already know him, I hope you'll get to know him better. Because if you're on the road to Jesus, you know that he's the living hope. He can change everything. And I want to assure you right now that this Jesus, this hope, this love that he has is available to everyone. But you must claim it because our God is a loving God. He's crazy about you. He's crazy in love with you, but he will not force himself upon you. He's there with his hand reaching out to you right now, but you've got to claim it. You've got to take his hand and it's there for all. God is with you. He's with you in the beginning. He's with you in the end, but you know what? He's with you in between times too. No matter how small the problem is or how big the problem is, God is with you. You know, the leadership of our church came out with a letter a couple of days ago that talked about hope. In fact, it would have been nice if they would have come out with this letter a week ago before I wrote this, this sermon so that I wouldn't have to do all the legwork on it But because uh, they had some great ideas. But one of the things they talked about is that, again, hope is in Jesus. It's not in positive thinking. It's not in our circumstances, whether they be good or bad. And now we're in the middle of a great political struggle in the United States. Whether you're leaning to the left or leaning to the right, hope is not in political reform. That, that just sways back and forth. That's just a pendulum. Yes, I'm not saying you shouldn't be involved in, in, in the decisions and voting, but that's not where our hope is. Our hope is not in political reform. Our hope is in focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And their focus was from Titus, Titus chapter, uh, Titus two chapter, uh, Titus chapter two verses eleven through thirteen. It reads like this: God's readiness to give and forgive is now public. Salvation's available for everyone. We're being shown how to turn our backs on a godless, indulgent life, and how to take on a God-filled, God-honoring life. This new life is starting. This is key here, folks. This new life is starting right now, and it's whetting our appetites for the glorious day when our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, appears. That's a great point. Our hope is only found in Jesus. Jesus alone, we can't look somewhere else for it. We must embrace the life of Jesus and his sacrifice. That will give you the peace and justice. It'll help you turn away from the ungodliness of the world to help us turn away from the passions that are out there. It'll redirect our priorities. It'll help us to live in God's promises now. And God's promise includes a vision for no injustice, for joy, for hope for us all. So I want you to consider in, the, in our featured scripture today, we're gonna to be looking at Isaiah chapter eight, verses 13 through 18. And the theme of this I want you to look at is this question, is our God your hiding place or is he a boulder blocking your way? Think about that. Is our God your hiding place or is he a boulder blocking your way? The prophet Isaiah chapter eight, I promised you we're gonna go through sequences. I'm not gonna go through every one of the 66 books of the Bible, but I promise you to go through sequences of the Bible to show one step after another how God is there with hope. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 13 through 18. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble. 
and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind up this testimony of warning and seal up God's instruction among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Are you putting your trust in him? Here am I, and the children of the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty, who dwells on Mount Zion. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that it touches each one of us, that we embrace it, that we hear it, that we feel it, that we sense your love, and we sense who you are for us, and we claim the hope that you offer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you were to break this, this message down a little bit, more specifically the, the uh, scripture that we've just looked at, part of what it's telling us is that the Godhead, God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, is really a subject of awe. It can be a subject of dread. You know, I talk about hope, but there's awe and dread, and, and candidly, there's some downright fear there. And it's unnatural if there isn't some fear. We tend to tremble when we stand in the, in the presence of the unknown. And as much as I want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ, we can't fully know him at this stage. He hasn't fully revealed himself. His, the depth of who he is is so great, you can't, you can't possibly fully embrace it. Not the sight of heaven. So it's natural to tremble. We, we don't tremble and fear his anger as much as we just tremble and fear and respect his amazing greatness the mercy he offers us the benefits they have a great influence on our mind you ever thought about what it's like many of us are, are pretty good at handling a crisis we don't tremble at a crisis we step up the adrenaline rushes in we handle the crisis a, a sudden car accident or swerving to miss a car or perhaps an altercation or an argument of some sort. We, we tend to, again, our adrenaline keeps us going through that, but afterwards, oftentimes we get the shakes, we get trembling. Oh my goodness, what did I just go through? Well, that's the same thing with God. You know, we, we are in awe with him because of who he is. He's so amazing. But the reverence we have for him, it's a great lesson we have to learn as we walk this line and we tremble in his presence, but we look for the hope that only he can offer. So to those who fear him, he shall be a sanctuary. In the Jewish mind, that, that's the first idea of a sanctuary, is it's a refuge, it's a safe place. It's a place to call home, to call peace. As we travel through the Old and New Testament, we find promises of God. And I want you to see that he is a sanctuary He's a, 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 a hiding place. He's not a boulder blocking our way. He's not somebody to be feared to a point we're afraid to move forward and we feel like we have no hope. He's a sanctuary where we're wrapped in his arms and we're, he's saying, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to carry you through this. I'm going to give you hope, hope eternal. Again, as we travel through the Old New Testament, I want to show you that you're going to find the promises of God consistently over and over again, giving you hope. So how does this relate to us? I want you to take his hand. In fact, I encourage you wherever you're sitting or laying in bed or whatever you're doing right now to just reach out, reach out and take his hand right now. Take his hand and say, okay, Lord, show me. Whether you believe him a little bit or a whole bunch, just take a little bit of faith. The Bible, the Word of God says that all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed. And if you ask for more faith, he'll give you more. So no matter where you are in your journey, no matter how much you're concerned, no matter how little hope you have right now, take his hand right now and walk through this with me. Walk through this with him. Trust him because he's crazy in love with you. You know, looking at where we are right now, are you distraught over the pandemic, over the fact that you can't get together with other people. Yeah, we're getting together this, this Sunday. We're, today we're having a worship service. Some of you are watching us 
online and some of you are watching us uh, right here in the sanctuary. But we still have limitations and we should because we have to take this COVID thing seriously because we love and care for you. We've got to be careful. But some of that is driving us nuts. This pandemic is difficult to deal with. It's causing some unrest, some financial struggles, some relationship struggles. The reality is, though, that God has a plan to bring you hope even through this. He's got Adam and Eve through worst disasters. He got the, the Israels through worst disasters. He, he wants to bring you hope, and he can bring you hope right now. Are you wrestling with, maybe angry, with the senseless death of George Floyd? So's God. But he wants to bring you comfort and hope through all of this. Are you maybe furious with the looters? You know what? So is God. He's weeping. He weeps at injustice. And he's angered at the violence. He wants hope for you. And he wants hope for me. And he wants to give it to you right now. As we go ahead and work through some of the Bible, looking at Psalm 1610, I need to give you scriptural support because what I say means nothing if it's not in the word of God. Psalm 16.10 says, basically he's teaching us that you're not, he's not going to abandon us to the grave. He's not going to abandon us to the grave at all. Psalm 16.10 reads, you canceled my ticket to hell. That's what we've all earned as a ticket to hell. He says, you've canceled my ticket to hell. You probably feel like you're going through hell at times right now on earth. But Psalm 16.10 says, God's canceled my ticket to hell. That's not my destination. And that doesn't have to be your destination today either. That's not what he wants for you. He wants to give you hope. He gives us a promise of eternal security through Jesus Christ. Of hope. Hope. Psalm 46.10 or 46.1. Again, over and over again, there's something in here. God is a safe place to hide. He's ready to help when we need him. There's hope. Hope. And God is... You know, he's, he's like our fathers, but he's even more so like our fathers. Today's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. We rejoice and celebrate all of you, and we thank you that our fathers and our father images. I look back to the influence my dad had on my life as I consider Father's Day. I remember little things and big things that he carried me through. I remember one time when I couldn't walk, I, I lost the feeling in my legs, and he picked me up and carried me as a seven or eight year old kid to the hospital. He gave me hope, he was there for me. I remember in Boy Scouts, I was, I was distraught over a little thing because I wanted to earn the next badge and I needed to, I needed to get out on another camping trip before, before some timetable was over, or I was gonna miss out on this badge, and my dad, my father, my loving father, who was exhausted from a week of work, said, I'm going to take you camping. You and I are going to go camping. With an hour's notice, we went camping on a Friday night, and he spent the day with me, the evening with me. We cooked, a we cooked over a campfire because he gave me hope. He was there for me. He loved me. My father-in-law became like another father to me. He was, uh, my wife and I had a, a car, and um, it, it had a four-speed transmission, and she didn't know how to drive a stick shift. And I wanted to teach her how to drive the stick shift, and it was a car that had lots of power. And she literally burned out the clutch learning how to drive that car. And we had no money. We were newlyweds. We were young. And my father-in-law stepped in and gave me hope. I was here without transportation. He said, Robert, pull the car in. Borrow my extra car and you and I will put that, that clutch in. And he worked side by side with me and taught me how to put in a new clutch. I had no idea. Hope, hope is there. The father's in our lives. One day I was out rafting with my brother-in-law who was visiting from New York and I did something really stupid. And I've done lots of stupid things, but I had my, I think he was probably seven or eight year old son with us in the raft. And my wife told my brother-in-law who's my wife's brother, and me both very adamantly make sure my son wears a life jacket. And the water had been so calm going down the river, and it was so hot that we all took off our life jackets, including my seven or eight-year-old kid. 
Suddenly, we came up on some rapids. No idea what was, I mean, that was just like that. And my seven or eight year old son fell out of the, out of the raft. And in a moment, I called, cried out, Lord, help me. And I reached out there. I literally had a split second to grab him. And I don't know what it would have happened. I had put my arm around his chest. He had marks across his chest because I grabbed him so tight as we pulled him back into the raft. There's hope that only God can give you, but it doesn't matter whether it's a small need or a big need, God is there for you. And by the way, uh, when, when we got back to shore, my uh, brother-in-law looked at my son and I looked at my son and we both said, now you cannot tell your mom about this. And when we got home, guess what? The first thing Ryan told his mom, he told on us, yeah, but there's hope. Now, the examples I've given of myself trying to be a good father and my father-in-law and my dad, we have to know that all those things come from God because God is the ultimate good father, the father of hope. And every good thing comes from God. We learn those things from him. There's hope throughout the Bible, and there's hope for you now, no matter what you're going through. Progressing on through the Bible more, Psalm 110. Psalm 110, I want to focus on uh, 110, 1 through 7, a, a David prayer. The word of God to my Lord, sit alongside me here on my throne until I make your enemies a stool for your feet. You are a strong scepter by God of Zion. Now rule those surrounded by enemies. Your people will freely join you, resplendent, resplendent in holy armor on the great day of your conquest. My point to that is all of this hope can be empty words unless there's the power and the authority and the ability to carry through and provide substance to the hope. God has given this hope that we have through Jesus Christ. He has given him complete power and authority and this is part of what signifies that power and authority that God has given to Jesus Christ, his son. As he told us again in Matthew 28, 18, it's all the power and authority under heaven has been given to him. You see, hope perpetuates. It multiplies. It multiplies through these many prophets. Hope grows. But we, meaning you and I, are called to get ready. Isaiah 40, verse 31 Again, I've got to show you scripture because my words don't mean much without scripture. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, But those who wait upon God get fresh strength. They spread their wings and soar like eagles. They run and don't get tired. They walk and don't lag behind. Are you running? Are you tired? Are you lagging behind? God wants to give you hope. He wants to give you hope right now, and it's free. Just reach out his hand and take it. That's all there is to it. This is comfort for God's people. Moving through the Bible some more, Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, 33 to 34 says, this is the brand new covenant. We're talking about hope. God's ready to make a new covenant, a new agreement with you right now. This is the brand new covenant that I will make with Israel or with you, say with me, right now, when the time comes, I will put my law within them, write it on their hearts, and be their God. He wants to be your God. He's crazy about you. And they will be my people. He wants you to be his people. They will no longer go around setting up schools to teach each other about God. They'll know me firsthand. The dull and the bright, the smart and the slow, I'll wipe the slate clean. There's hope. No matter what's going on in your life, he says, I will wipe the slate clean for each of them. I'll forget they ever sinned. That's God's decree. It's amazing, amazing hope for you and for me. Can you imagine what it would be like? Not just to read about it. It's wonderful to read in his word, but to know him firsthand. That will give you true hope that I hope that you're ready to embrace. Daniel, moving on through the Bible, Daniel, let's see, 7, 13 to 14. 
Daniel's having a dream. Daniel's another prophet. He says, I saw a human form, a son of man, arriving in a whirl of clouds. He came to the old one and was presented to him. He was given power to rule all the glory of royalty. Everyone, race, color, and creed had to serve him. His rule will be forever, never ending. His kingly rule will never be replaced. We talk about politics. We talk about things going from one to another, the pendulum swinging back and forth. Wouldn't it be great not just to have hope, but to be on a path of joy where you're no longer worried about tomorrow? The word of God says that Jesus, the rule of Jesus Christ will rule perpetually forever and ever in love and hope and joy and peace. That's what we want to claim. You see, it goes on in, in the prophet Obadiah. Obadiah 1.15 says, God's judgment day is near for all the godless nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. What, will, what you did will boomerang back and hit your head. What he's saying here, offering us hope, is the day of the Lord is near. He's saying that he is going to bring judgment and he's going to bring righteousness to the world. And how's he going to do this? Through the Lord Jesus Christ, whom I've been trying to show you as we read through the word of God, day after day, week after week. It's in here. It's in his word. He says, Jesus entered from the beginning. He was shown to us in Genesis because Jesus was, is, and always will be. He's permeated throughout. People who tell me, why are you spending time on the Old Testament? Focus on Jesus. Jesus is throughout the Old Testament. Jesus is here from the beginning. What's his solution? His solution is to give us Jesus. Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 2. Our all-powerful God gives us Jesus. It says, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom. Doesn't matter what you're going through right now. There will be no more gloom. Isn't that great? No more gloom for those of us in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, or let's say the land of California or America, or let's say the land of my home and your home. He humbled us, but in the future, he will honor our land by the way of the sea along the Jordan, by the way of the Sacramento River, the American River, all of Northern California, the people walking in darkness. We've been walking in darkness, but we can see this great light, this great light of Jesus. What he's saying, our all-powerful God is telling us here, our all-powerful and loving God, he's coming to balance the scales. He's sending Jesus to balance the scales. He will establish his rule and he'll establish David's throne. He'll give us hope, the hope we've been longing for, the hope we've been expecting, the hope of certainty. You know, the, 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 uh, the Israelites had been captured and taken to Babylon at one point, years after they were freed from Egypt. They were captured and taken to Babylon, and they're sitting there going, no, having no idea other than the promise of God, which is, is also, it's verifiable, it's something to cling to, it's something we can own. They had no idea what was gonna happen. In fact, they went through 400 plus years some say about 450 years of what we call the intertestamental period. It's the period when the Old Testament ends and the New Testament begins where God is considered silent. There's no scripture in, in that time period. And they're wondering, what do I do? But they had to cling to their faith. Their faith gave them hope through that 450 years. They had no idea that God was gonna come to save them in human form as himself as a baby, no less. But that's what they did. That's what gave them hope. He came in. He said that he would do it, and he was there for them. So where is your hope to be found? God has a plan for us. See, God has a plan for me. Right now, no matter what I'm going through, he has a plan for me. Hope is based in fact. God is crazy in love with you. It says so from A to Z in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, it says God is crazy in love with you. Number two, hope is based in firm conviction. Firm conviction, God cares for you and he never wants to give up on you. Hope gives you assurance. God desires to live in your heart. 
Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. He's talking to you. He has a plan, even in your time of hopelessness. You see, church, we can't make it without hope. I wrote, I read an author who said that we can go 40 days without food. We can go eight days without water. We can go four minutes without air. But we can only go a few seconds without hope. Where is your hope today? Is it lost in the darkness that surrounds your life? God wants you to reclaim your hope through him now. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your message of hope. I pray each one grabs it and claims it this very day. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Have a good week.